Okay. Good evening. Welcome to class. We have some uh, Holy Communion stuff to talk about this evening. Um, so eighth graders, three eighth graders are hopefully watching this at home. Um, we passed out a bunch of information. Michelle will email it to your parents, so they may already have that. Part of the deal, you have to uh, you have to pick confirmation verse, and uh, so one of the worksheets is that. Um, I will have Michelle also put them in your mailboxes, so if you uh, don't print at home or can't print at home, you'll have them in your mailboxes. Um, eighth graders, we're also going to choose your uh, confirmation paper topic this evening. There are... Um, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10 eighth graders, so we will pick um, one of the six chief parts to write your paper on. You need to write that like now and email it back to me, okay? So um, I didn't give you a lot of time this year because honestly when I've given a lot of time, uh, people do it right before it's due anyway. So. Um, I find that it's not really uh, useful to give you a ton of time to write your confirmation paper. Confirmation paper is, um, uh, you'll be reading that at Night of Witness. How many of you have been to Night of, or haven't been to Night of Witness to see what that looks like? All right, the new guys. Um, so, um, yeah, so the Night of Witness, there's a, it's kind of a sort of a church, sort of a church service. And then uh, as part of that, you'll stand up in front of, not 7th graders, just 8th graders. You'll stand up in front of everybody that's gathered there, your family and grandparents and sponsors and friends and whoever else deigns to come to confirmation for you. Um, and uh, you'll read your paper as part of that. And we'll do those on the 60 parts. So, huh? In front of us? Yeah, in front of the whole lectern, in front of everybody. Um, be, be lucky. Last year when James was here, I had like... Uh, I don't know, 40 people from my family were there. So it won't be as big as that. You only have 10 people, so it won't be huge. 40 people from your family? Probably, yeah. Of course, that. There probably weren't quite that many yet confirmation, but. Um, so uh, we'll pick those. Um, before you leave tonight, we'll need to pick uh, those. So we'll leave it, we'll uh, end a couple minutes early. All right, so last week, last week we talked about the nature of the sacrament of the altar. All right, and uh, what what is, if you just had to summarize the sacrament of the altar, what is the sacrament of the altar? You will not be able to receive it if you do not, if you cannot answer this. What is the nature of the sacrament of the altar? Trace? Body, blood, Christ. It's a good start. Ma uh, Madeline? Given to us so we can be saved. Close, but no. Given for, <coughs> Given for the forgiveness of sins. S uh, I mean, okay, right? Um, just because somebody comes in and eats the body and blood of Jesus doesn't mean that they're saved. Right? Because faith comes by hearing the word or through holy baptism, and that brings salvation. All right? So um, we do talk about, we do talk about receiving the gifts of God in the Lord's Supper. Forgiveness, life, salvation. It's the trifecta that we talk about. So Madeline, you're not wrong, right? But it's really the uh, awesome. Thank you very much. Sure that, like that is that is beautiful, just what I wanted. All right. Um, uh, that is, uh, so you weren't like wrong, but, but just to focus that up a little bit, we really, it's, it's forgiveness of sins is like the big chief gift that we'll actually get to. But, so the nature of the sacrament, if you turn to page 193 in your book, 193, um, Martin Luther asks the question, what is the sacrament of the altar? What is the sacrament of the altar? And the answer at the top of the page, read it together. It is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and the wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and drink. And if you wanted to tag on for forgiveness, life, salvation, 
that would really work there also. But when we talk about what the sacrament of the altar is, this is an important statement. It is the true body and blood of Jesus. Not the body and blood of Jesus. The true body and blood of Jesus um, under the bread and wine, in with and under the bread and wine. Earthly elements. Instituted by Christ for us Christians to eat and drink for forgiveness, life, and salvation. All right? It's just a really, really, really important statement there that we understand what the nature of the sacrament is. All right? Um, what is it that makes the sacrament then the sacrament? Above all, above all else, what makes, what makes the Lord's Supper a sacrament? For that matter, what makes baptism a sacrament? Um, it was instituted by Jesus. Yes. And so another way to say that is, what did he do when he instituted it? Spoke what? His word. Right? It's Jesus' word that makes it a sacrament. Right? It's Jesus' word that makes it a sacrament. It's Jesus' word that makes it the body and blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. All right? It's all on account of Jesus' word. Does the pastor doing it make a difference? No. Does the sinfulness of the pastor doing it make a difference? Yes. No. Then you will never receive the Lord's Supper if you don't receive it because of my sinfulness. Right? Because, well, am I sinful all the time? Yes. yes. If, if my sinfulness makes it not the sacrament, would you ever be able to receive the sacrament? No. No. So, the sinfulness of the pastor doesn't matter. The, the, who the pastor is doesn't matter. Um, nothing matters except the word of Jesus. Right? The word of Jesus makes it... A sacrament. Without the words of Jesus, it's not a sacrament. How often should we receive the Lord's Supper? Colton? Alright, so he doesn't say it, but it's good practice to receive it when it's offered. Right? Uh, why? Why would we receive it when it's offered? Why would we receive it when it's offered? Cool. Because it's a gift of God. Why else would we receive it when it's offered? Because you are always sinful. sinful. Right? What's the sacrament for? Well, we haven't technically gotten to it, but we've said it enough times. What's the sacrament for? Forgiveness of sins. Right? Why wouldn't why wouldn't this be something we would want to receive as often as we are able? Right? Um, do we sacrifice Jesus over and over and over again when we celebrate the Lord's Supper? No. Why not? Nick. Sacrificed on the cross. Yet he was sacrificed on the cross. And, and you have to say three more words. Those are pretty good words, but they aren't the right ones there. He was sacrificed on the cross. Ava? Nope. He was sacrificed on the cross. For forgiveness. How? Nope. He was sacrificed on the cross. How many times? Once. Once for who? Us. Who? All. There is a difference between us and all, yes? Yes. Because us is just the people in this room. There's a big difference between us and all. He was sacrificed once for all. Once for all. Which means we don't sacrifice Jesus over and over and over again. But his gifts come from the cross when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, right? What is the Lord's Supper? What do we call the Lord's Supper? Besides the sacrament. What else is the Lord's Supper, Madeline? Communion. 
Oh, I'm, yeah, that's true, true, true enough, true enough. A category, what, what, would that, what would that category of the Lord's Supper fall into? It's one of, the means of grace. it's one of the means of grace, right? So it's one of the ways, Trace, that God delivers his grace into our lives. All right, um, who can remember what the fancy word, the fancy word for, for the, uh, the bread and the wine actually turning into body and blood of Jesus? Do you remember the fancy word? No. Transubstantiation. Did we get to that? Did we do page 196? All right, then we are on 196. 196. Thank you, Kyle. As we were, as I was saying that word, I didn't think uh, that we got to that. All right, so we're on page 196, and uh, read that first paragraph for us, nice and loudly, um, Paul. Now we have a better overall idea of what the sacrament of the altar is. Over the next three lessons, we'll look at how it looks, how it works in more detail. There will always be questions, though, as to some specifics on how we are to approach receiving the sacrament of the altar. In fact, different Christian denominations or church bodies often believe different things about it. Below are three major differences between the Lutheran view and other denominations' views of what it is. Read the difference, read the question, and practice using the Lutheran sense. All right, so Lutheran. Yeah, that'll work. Um, Roman Catholic and other. That boy. I want to actually if I make this chart. Oh no, that worked. first pink bubble that says Jesus body and blood aren't really in the bread and the wine it's just a symbol or picture of what he did long ago how would you respond to that statement based on what we talked about last week that the bread and the wine are just a symbol of what Jesus did a long time ago how would you how would you respond to that Paul um, I, would, I would first say that they were wrong and that the and that Okay. Why would you why would you make that assertion? Why would you say that? Well also it says in the Bible that Jesus says that this is my body, so they should be they should be listening to the Bible. Alright. So Luther Luther said is means Other Christians, there's a lot of other Christians that say is means is means symbolizes. They don't believe that Jesus means that it is. And the reason they don't believe it are many and varied, but that one of the primary reasons is that when Jesus ascended into heaven, the Bible says he sits at the right hand of God. Is that a is that a place necessarily? What's the right hand of God usually denote? Jesus. True enough, but what's the right hand of the king? What's the right hand of the king symbolize? Power. That's exactly right. Power. So Jesus sits down at the right hand of God, which means that he sits in the seat of power. Does that mean that Jesus has to only be in heaven all the time? No. He's who? Who is he? Jesus. God. He's God. That's exactly right. So, can Jesus be here? Yes. 
Can Jesus be in the bread and wine? Yes. Can Jesus be anywhere He decides to be? Yes. 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 But for a lot of Christians... Jesus doesn't mean that it really is his body and blood it, it, because they can't comprehend how Jesus can be in heaven and also on the altar of hundreds, maybe thousands, tens of thousands of churches every Sunday morning. They can't conceptualize how that can be. So, they limit Jesus. They limit Jesus. Jesus can't be in our church at our altar because... There's too many churches. He's at the right hand of God. He is God, though. Don't limit Jesus. This, this limits Jesus. We should not be in the habit of limiting what Jesus can do, right? All right, so what would these other Christians, what do these Christians receive when they receive the Lord's Supper? What are, what are the things that they receive when they receive the Lord's Supper? Colton? No, no, no. Out of these four things, how would I fill in the chart here? How would I fill in the chart? What are the things that they would receive in the Lord's Supper? Very good, Andrew. Bread and wine. Body? No. no. Blood? No. No, because they don't believe that it's there. If you go, if you go to a Baptist church and receive Holy Communion, you're receiving nothing. Doesn't really matter what you believe about the Lord's Supper. They don't believe that it's the body and blood of Jesus. So you're not receiving the body and blood of Jesus. Do you think you should go to a Baptist church and receive the Lord's Supper? Probably not. No, it does nothing for you. So, I, I mean, I've never witnessed a Baptist communion, but if they're, if they're combining the elements with the Word... Yeah, that's a really good question, but it's it's also we would say um, we would say that it's also also what the faith of the assembly the is based on the intent of the faith of the assembly. Yeah, um, Vicar and I were talking about that one day, and and uh, he shot an email to Professor Bierman just to check if I was right. Um, All right, so what do Lutherans receive when they receive the Lord's Supper? Oh, all of it. All of it, right? We receive the bread and the wine and the body and the blood. We receive it all, right? Um, because we take Jesus at his word, this is my body and this is my blood, but it obviously doesn't change into anything else. All right, the next bubble there, it says <coughs> the bread and the wine get replaced with Jesus' body and blood in the sacrament. It's transformed completely. <clears throat> That's the belief that the Roman Catholic Church takes. And so for Roman Catholics, they would probably say something like this. Is means... Is means transformed into. So, what do you suppose looking at this list that Roman Catholics believe they receive? Body and blood. Body and blood. Not the bread and not the wine. This, this uh, special teaching is called trans. You know what trans means? What's the prefix trans mean? What? Change. Trans. Substan change in what? A change in substance. Transubstantiate stan stanciation. Transubstantiation. I think that's how you spell it. Transubstantiation means that it changes substance. So it's no longer the substance of bread, but it's the substance of body. And it's no longer the substance of wine, but it's the substance of blood. It'll still smell and taste and feel like bread and wine, but it's not bread and wine. And they do some finagling with Greek philosophy. They, it's, uh, it's all based on Greek philosophy. 
in terms of explaining why it still tastes like bread and wine, but the substance is the body and blood. All right. You're so what the these guys, these guys expect too little of Jesus, right? Um, the Roman Catholics, because they think so highly of Jesus, go overboard. They go too far. They go farther than they need to because they think very highly of Jesus, right? Um, and so they say is transformed into. Martin Luther said, you don't need all that Greek philosophy to explain anything in the Bible. You don't need, you don't need human reason to explain things in the Bible. Let's just take the Bible at its own word. So is means is. Yeah, so there's not a problem going to another Christian church, right? Typically, you wouldn't want to take the Lord's Supper because although they believe that it's the body and blood of Jesus, there's a lot of other things that the Roman Catholics hold to that we don't, right? And so the Lord's Supper, and we're not there yet, but the Lord's Supper also matters about the other things that we believe, teach, and confess to. And when you go to the Lord's Supper, you're really saying, hey, what you believe is what I believe. Not just about the Lord's Supper, but about everything. Alright? That makes sense? And so as you go to the Lord's Supper, you're really saying, oh, well, you believe it's body and blood. I believe it's body and blood too. Arguably, you could take the Lord's Supper at, at a Roman Catholic church and receive the gifts of God. I, I arguably I think you could. But we don't, we don't for other reasons. So over here, we don't because you're not receiving the body and blood of Jesus, so don't take communion at these other churches. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff we don't believe together, right? Here is more of the issue of we don't believe a lot of things together as Christians. Uh, but we always affirm what we do believe, right? Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, we believe we believe in those really um, important kinds of things. All right. So again, what would you say to a Roman Catholic who holds this view? Is means is. Just take Jesus at His word. Don't don't add to His word. Don't subtract from His word. Just take Jesus at His word. Is means is. All right, the third one, each time we have the sacrament of the altar, Jesus' body is sacrificed once more on the altar. Um, that's, again, Roman Catholics believe that. Roman Catholics believe that they re-sacrifice Jesus every time. And, and we would simply say, look, Hebrews says that he was sacrificed once for all. Once means once, right? One sacrifice on the cross for everyone all forgiveness, all time. The gift is simply given in the Lord's Supper. So we don't have to sacrifice Jesus again and again and again. Alright? Questions on any of that? No? Alright. You look like you took a breath like you were going to ask something. Gotcha. Gotcha. A sick or gotcha? All right. All right. Lesson forty-nine, page one ninety-seven. What is the benefit of eating and drinking? So we've already looked a little bit at this because it's hard to talk about the Lord's Supper without talking about the benefits. But what's the benefit of Lord's Supper? Let's read this paragraph together. These words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Show us that in the sacrament, forgiveness of sins, life and salvation are given us through these words. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. And we see that in scriptures time and time again. Where people are forgiven of their sins, they receive salvation. The thief on the cross is a great example. Jesus forgives his sins and says, today you will be with me in paradise, right? You, you will be with me in paradise. Salvation. So he receives forgiveness and along with that salvation. Um, 
So let's read the uh, red paragraph, Evan, nice and loudly. As Christians, we can test of the forgiveness of sins brought by the death of Jesus on the cross. It's now delivered to us in body and blood of Christ. Why do we say that it's delivered like that? What does that mean the Lord's Supper is? What is the Lord's Supper if it's delivering, delivering forgiveness, life, and salvation? Lauren? Means of grace. A means of grace. Very good. And continue, please. This is the most important gift or treasure that you can receive. The forgiveness, this forgiveness, sets us free from our sinful past in which death and the tyranny of Satan are our only future. Christ's body and blood give us a new life and a new future. All right. Um... So, in the gray box down there, how does the truth about the gift of forgiveness that's ours in Christ make Christians different from everybody else? How does this truth that the forgiveness of sins that is ours in Christ makes Christians different from everybody else. How, how does the fact that we receive forgiveness of sins make us different from everybody else in the world? If it doesn't make us different, you might as well not be a Christian. Correct? Mm -hmm. Alright, so how does it make us different from everyone else in the world? Colton? Um, we have faith. Um, that is true. I will give you half credit for that answer. But but that's not um, that's not per se connected to the forgiveness of sins. We receive the forgiveness of sins by faith. So if you're really, uh, I mean, you're st you're at the starting point now. Faith faith is important gift of God because it receives that forgiveness of sins. But how does the forgiveness of sins that you receive from Jesus make you different from everybody else in the world? Sam? Uh, if we actually see or hear the words that we are truly forgiven from all of our sins. And? Big deal? Well, it's a big deal. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. Go a little bit more with that. How does that make us different from everybody else in the world? Uh, you're close, Sam. Somebody want to continue that thought? What's true about all people in the world, including you, in terms of sin? We are all sinful people. Are you less of a sinner than the unbeliever that you know at school? No. Nope. You are not less of a sinner than the one that you know at school. So, with that in mind, how does the truth about the gift of forgiveness that is ours in Christ make us different from everyone else in the world? And Ethan, we are forgiven. Uh, I could accept that, I guess. That gets at it. I mean, all three of you, Sam, Colton, Ethan, you finally kind of got there, right? Here, here's the answer to this. You need to write this down. Our sins are not held against us. Our sins are not held against us. 
it's a little bit, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit better of an explanation than what Ethan said, right? It, it's more than simply being forgiven. Technically, all people in the world are forgiven by Christ's sacrifice, aren't they? Mm -hmm. All people are forgiven. That still doesn't get at why we're different from the rest of the world. Well, we're different from the rest of the world because our sins aren't held against us. All right? It's a very, very important concept there. Our sins are not held against us. All right. Next paragraph. Nice and loudly for us, Riley, so the camera can hear you. On page 198? Yes, on page 198. Alright, so on the uh, tan scroll, Andrew, nice and loudly. Okay, uh, we need to follow along with this because you need to understand the story. So, Trace is going to read from the beginning of that. And if your eyes are not on your page, you are going to stand up and read it. And we'll just take as long as it takes to read this. Trace, everybody should be looking, should be looking at page 198 and nothing else. God made the world. Humans disobeyed God because of this. Sin and death came into the world and mankind's relationship with God was broken. Alright, Genesis 1 to 3. <clears throat> Keep going. Yet God promised to rescue his people from sin and death and, ena and enacted a great plan to restore his creation one day. Centuries passed and God's people became slaves in Egypt. Alright, so we had Abraham who got called out of the land of Ur. Abraham had, who was his son? Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob's name was renamed to Israel, Israel. and Jacob slash Israel had how many sons? Twelve sons. They become the twelve tribes of Israel. The second youngest name is Joseph. Joseph's brothers hate him. They throw him in a well. They sell him to Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites take him down to Egypt, sell him into slavery. Joseph is in slavery. Joseph then interprets Pharaoh's dreams, becomes governor of Egypt, saves Egypt and the whole surrounding land from famine. And Joseph's family all come down. They have the big brotherly forgiveness things. Wow. The family settles in Egypt, and they prosper in Egypt. And then a new Pharaoh comes to power, um, a bunch of years later that don't know who the heck Joseph was and doesn't care who Joseph was. And then he puts the Israelites into slavery. They are in slavery for 450 years. Trace, continue. Centuries passed and God's people became slaves in Egypt. They were a great nation, but they were not free and they were not in the promised land. God remembered his covenant and called Moses to go to Egypt and be God's tool for freeing his people. God used Moses to perform wonders in Egypt in order to free God's people from slavery. After nine such wonders or plagues on Egypt, the king Pharaoh of Egypt still would not let God's people go. The tenth plague, the greatest one, was known as the Passover. After this one, Pharaoh had no, no choice but to let God's people go. This is the Passover meal that was reenacted each year by God's people. All right, so um, what, was, what was the tenth plague? Kill all the firstborn in Egypt. All the firstborn in Egypt. Um, and so, and so, um, uh, God 
gives the Israelites a way to be rescued from that tenth plague. What was the way to be rescued from the tenth plague? Um, Lauren? They were to kill a lamb and paint the blood on the Kill a perfect lamb, paint the blood on the door frame of the house. All right? So that that blood covers the <coughs> house, right? And then the angel of death does what? Passes, passes. passes over the house. Now they're supposed to take that lamb and cook it in a special way, eat it in a special way with other special things, um, dressed in a special way. All of those things were done on that night. Because the next day, Pharaoh said, Go. And so through this, through this tenth plague, God rescued his people from Egypt and rescued his people from death, ultimately. Not just slavery, but also rescued them from death. And they uh, leave Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, they come to Mount Sinai and become the nation of Israel uh, after they finally make it into the Promised Land 40 years later. All right? That, that meal, that meal, um, the killing of that lamb and eating that special meal happened every year to commemorate the Passover, to remind them of what God had done for them in Egypt. All right? You can read all about it in Exodus 12, 1 to 14. We're not going to need to do that right now. Uh, re, uh, I think what we're going to do is stop there because I can't get that done in five minutes or three minutes. All right. Um, Stephen and Quinn, forget, uh, sleep in. Gotcha. All right. So you guys need to watch the. Um, you guys want to watch the video. All right. And uh, um, Michelle, send that to your parent, to your mom. All right. Okay, eighth graders. I need you to fill this out. I'm going to let the girls go first. All right. This is the paper that you will be writing. This is the paper you will be writing about uh, for your, um, put it next to the word, for your confirmation paper for the night of witness. Quentin and Stephen will explain Why, more of that to you later. Just sign up for a topic. Thank you very much, Quentin. Uh, tables and chairs, guys. Snap, snap. Why not until we cross the list? So Paul, for a little lot of stuff there. You can kind of do summary of all the questions. You could talk about prayer, the Lord's Prayer in general. Right? You could, there's a lot of stuff you can do with that. Uh, McKenna, Ten Commandments, same way. You have the option, I mean, you can kind of summarize all the commandments. You can talk about how important one the gospel is. You can write. What you want to do, eighth graders? Hey, eighth graders. What you want to do is kind of, whatever you're doing your paper on, <clears throat> rework through the section of your catechism. So, Lauren, for baptism, you want to read all four parts of baptism, all the questions and answers. That'll help you write your paper. Don't write crap, or you're going to write it again and again and again. Feel free to have your parents or grandparents read it for you and with you. All right? They can even give you some ideas. I don't care. All right. If the list is exhausted, you can double up. Pick another one. Write your name on the uh, left side of it. Yes. You would not want to write about the unimportance of it. Yeah, that was my attempt at sarcasm. Um, yeah, so what did you pick? Yeah, so so you want to, I mean, there's a lot there. 